Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Stephanie Peacock. She's a, she was a staff doctor at the True North Health Center, but she's going to start lecturing there again very soon. So she's going to talk today about how environmental, environmental, I don't know what that is. That's a cross between, I'm doing like 50 shows a week, guys, like more for a bundle. Okay. Environmental chemical. When you smush it together, it's environment. Anyway, let's take two. Dr. Stephanie Peacock is going to discuss how environmental chemicals can prevent you from losing weight. Please welcome her to the show. How are you, Dr. Peacock? It's been a while. Hi, Chef AJ. I'm good. How are you? I love that smush you did. It was like, um, yeah, envir- environmental chemicals. Environmentals are some kind of new word. But I'm curious, when did you get so interested in this topic? Because I, I hear about it, you know, a little bit here and there, like what plastic water bottles, receipts. When did you start getting interested in this particular topic? Yeah, I would say it started about a couple of years ago, um, but really it had a lot to do with my own personal health journey. Um, so i personally dealt with a lot of um, like hormone imbalance and gut dysbiosis for many years of my life. And even with switching my diet to whole food plant-based and, you know, incorporating meditative practices, good exercise routines, et cetera. Um, I still wasn't feeling, seeing like the full optimal results that I knew I could. And that's when I just kind of went back into the literature and just started discovering the impact that these various chemicals can have on our hormones and our gut. And so I just really spent a lot of time researching it. And then once I got into this space, I saw more practitioners and people talking about it. And I was like, okay, so this is definitely a topic that's out there. It's not super, super common yet, but um, I'm happy to be bringing awareness to it. And thanks for having me on the show. Cause I'm excited to chat about it today. Yeah. I can't wait. So, so like you have, well, first of all, let's talk about your offering in the bundle, which, which is basically this. Yes. Yeah. So, so I offer, um, it's a 50 page ebook that I actually created specifically for this bundle. Um, I had a lot of fun creating it. So, um, basically it's about, um, talking about the five most common environmental chemicals that are found in our everyday products that have been linked to disrupting our gut microbiome and also contributing to resistant weight loss. So I provide a little bit of a history context surrounding each of the various chemicals, how you can swap them out, And then I provide recipes at the end, all whole food, plant-based, salt, oil, sugar-free that can support your gut and detoxification pathways um, and eliminating these toxins that you come into contact with. I think a lot of people don't realize that they come in contact with any toxins because, you know, there's just these these things that are supposed to make the world convenient actually are killing us. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So, yeah. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat about it today. And um, during the presentation, if you have any questions or there's any questions that come up, like please, please feel free to stop me. I'm happy to answer like any questions along the way. That'd be great. And guys, if you have any questions for Dr. Peacock, let's start with this topic. Please put them in the chat. Great. All right. Is it okay to start now? Yeah, please. It'd be great. All right. Great. Okay. Let's see. Portion screen. Okay. And then share. Let me make sure it's sharing. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? I love it. Oh, what a great slide. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I always have fun coming up with these two, like just, you know, making it look pretty. All right. All right, guys. So um, like we chatted about, yeah, and I'm kind of calling this presentation the missing link because it's something that we definitely don't think about the topic of environmental chemicals. So, all right, let's get started. Okay. So um, in the topic of environmental toxins, specifically environmental health, um, in this, in the whole topic of it, when we're talking about chemicals, um, I'm not talking about all chemicals. I'm really just talking about chemicals that have been linked to disrupting our gut, disrupting our health in a variety of different ways, because everything is a chemical. If you think about it. So, you know, air is a chemical, water is a chemical, our hormones are chemicals. So we're not saying all chemicals are bad. We're just talking about ones that have been linked to health issues or have been linked to having the potential of causing health issues. So I just wanted to kind of make that clear. Um, And so talking about the bad chemicals, so there are over 84,000 chemicals in our everyday items and only 1% have been tested for human safety. Worldwide, there's over 350,000 chemicals and chemical mixtures that are registered for production and use. Now I know that's kind of a daunting statistic, but I'm going to make this and break this down so it's not as daunting. Um, But I always like to provide a little bit of context before I get into talking about them. So like the reason how these came into our everyday products. So 
Um, starting around World War II in 1939, that's when the production of chemicals increased to more than 20 fold. That was when, uh, well, the Industrial Revolution had already been occurring, but that's when things started to really ramp up and we were starting to really use a lot more chemicals in everyday production. Um, fast forward about 40 years, 62,000 chemicals were grandfathered in under the Toxic Substances and Control Act, um, otherwise known as TOSCA. Now they were grandfathered in, so none of them were actually ever tested for safety. Um, and then, you know, fasting forward a few years, that's when we got this statistic where the number of chemicals registered had actually increased by over 30%. And now today, that's where we see this number of 84,000 chemicals registered with less than 1% being tested for human safety and allowed. Um, and I'm such a visual person, so I like these graphs, and I thought this graph was pretty interesting. So this is just showing, again, you can see the start where we chatted about in the previous slide, 1939, the start of World War II, that's when chemical production started to increase. And then you see the triangles there, that's actually the, um, the percentage of overweight adults, and we know that um, obviously, the more overweight, more obesity, things like that, that increases metabolic disruption and metabolic um, issues within the body. And that's when we also see, um, sorry, that's when we all start to also see um, disease rates occur. And so you can kind of see a little bit of a trajectory there as the increase in production of chemicals and then the increase in overweight adults. So one more quick thing I wanted to mention before we get into talking about the fun stuff about all the different chemicals. Um, so I just wanted to... Um, you know, shed some light on the fact that there are th there are studies that are done on testing the amount of chemicals that are found within us. So the Center for Disease Control, they conduct these human biomonitoring studies. They test it through NHANES, which is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, designed to collect info on the health and nutrition of the population. Um, to date, they've found more than 300 chemicals in 98% of the population. So we know that these chemicals are in us. They're measuring them through levels of in our urine, our blood, serum, and breast milk. All right, so I know that was kind of a lot to digest. Yes, we are exposed to hundreds of different chemicals, um, but we, and we, the, the point of this presentation is not to tell you that you need to go 100% toxin free, because um, that's pretty much impossible at this point, right? Like we live in an increasingly polluted world, sadly, um, but the point is to create that awareness and that empowerment that you can change certain things within your home. And a lot of these things that you can change actually are free. Like there are things that you could just throw out, and we'll get into all this, that you can just you know, throw out and not buy again, because we know that those do contribute to health issues. And so we'll get into some of the details of that in a second. But yeah, we live in an increasingly polluted world. Um, what occurs is that over time, when we are exposed to these different chemicals, it can overburden our body's natural ability to eliminate them. So we have six different detoxification pathways, our gut and liver being two of the more predominant ones. Um, but what occurs is that when that accumulation occurs within our body, we start to develop those symptoms. And I'll, the next slide here has um, a list of the different symptoms here. As you can see, I'm not gonna go through all of these. We would spend a lot of time talking about all these individually, but for the purpose of the presentation, we're just gonna be talking about digestive issues and resistant weight loss. And something else that I also wanted to just um, shed a little bit of light on is that when I'm talking about toxins, the environmental toxins, I'm not talking about acute toxicity, which is where, you know, that someone gets um, that acute toxic exposure and they have to go to the emergency room. I'm talking about this chronic low dose exposure, which is what we see um, within the products that we're using that we're getting exposed to that are known to cause subtle changes in our physiology that can lead to disease or um, different illnesses over time. Okay. So here's the fun stuff. So how do they impact our gut and our ability to lose weight? So there are four different ways that they're able to. Um, the first one here, and I, and I also outline these in the book too in a little bit more detail, but I'm just going to briefly go over them. So they can activate something called the PPAR gamma pathway. This pathway is the primary regulator of fat cell development. So when this, when this pathway gets triggered, right? We're going to be holding on to more fat. We're going to be developing more fat cells. And then also um, it triggers metabolic disruption. So we know metabolic disruption leads to inflammation and can lead to a whole host of chronic diseases. Um, it also can influence leptin and ghrelin, which are, hunger and, are, are our hunger and satiety hormones. It can disrupt our good gut bacteria. We know that um, within our colon, our large intestine, we have good and bad bacteria, right? The good try to keep the bad in check, but if we start to get that imbalance and that dysbiosis within the gut, right? That increases more pathogenic strains leading to inflammation and leading to um, chronic diseases. And then also 
um, increasing intestinal permeability, also known, known as leaky gut. That lining is in our intestine. It's really just one cell wall thick. It doesn't take much to disrupt it. But when that gets disrupted, right, that leads to inflammation and a more absorption of things from our food and things that we come into contact with. So these are the five that I talk about in depth in the book, um, BPA, bisphenol A, phthalates, pesticides, heavy metals, and PFAS. I'm gonna just be talking about the first three for this PowerPoint presentation, um, but the rest of it is in the book. All right, so I wanted to kind of also hone in on where do we find these in our kitchen, right? Because in our kitchen, that's where we spend a lot of our time, right? That's coming into contact with our food, it's coming into contact with our water supply. So how do we avoid these within the kitchen? So let's first talk about bisphenol. So otherwise known as BPA, that's the most common um, one, but there are actually 30 to 40 different variants of bisphenol. BPA is just the most common one that's been used. It was originally used as a synthetic estrogen, but was later found to be able to harden plastic, which is why we find it in a lot of our plastic materials. Um, and now when it comes to uh, BPA-free, something I just wanted to mention really quick, and I do mention this in the book, is that when they're, it's a great marketing tactic and loophole a lot of companies can use because when it's BPA free, they're actually still using another form of bisphenol, usually BPF or BPS, which are found to be just as harmful, if not more harmful than BPA itself. So, and, and I'm just putting this out there again. I, you know, I had been using BPA free products for uh, many years. I'm not perfect. This is just information I came across a few years ago. And so, which is why I'm super passionate about sharing the information. So um, BPA, you know, or bisphenol is found in the lining of canned items, um, to go lids, like on those like plastic, like if you go to a coffee shop, right. For tea or coffee, um, it's found on those found in cash register receipts, like Chef AJ mentioned before. And then also in a lot of different plastic items. Um, and I also link in the book about how BPA, um, what else it is linked to, but it is a hormone disruptor, a delicate, it, you know, disrupts our delicate hormonal system. It has been um, linked to leaky gut and then also um, ulcerative colitis. So some great swaps that you can make, some easy ones. I always like to think, okay, what are we using every day that is coming into contact with a lot of these different um, chemicals? And so I think, okay, so we're eating, you know, two to four times a day. Um, we're drinking water every day or drinking, you know, some form of beverage every single day. So how do we, so th those are great swaps to make in reducing your exposure. So example, reducing plastic containers and water bottles. So um, opting for glass or stainless steel. I have a couple listed here. I love hydro flask. I love clean canteen. Um, and then what are you storing your food in? I always like to say, okay, well, if you're storing in plastic, let's start to reduce the plastic and let's start to add in maybe some more glassware. I know it's a little bit heavier, <laughs> but, but it, well, it amounts to huge changes over time. So um, opting for some more glassware as opposed to plasticware with storing your food, even those silicone bags are absolutely fantastic. I have a bunch of those stasher bags and those are really great because they're nice and bendy. You can even, they're great for freezing items as well. Um, and then reducing canned items, opting for fresh. Now that is not, you know, completely uh, available for every single person. And that's the point I want to make here again, is it's not about being hundred percent toxin free. It's just doing what you can and where you can, right? So if there's a night a week that you're just so, so busy and you can't, you know, make fresh food, right. And you're going to use canned items instead, like that's fine. It's just a matter of reducing where and when you can over the period of um, years, right. And then again, here's swapping this swapping the Ziploc for silicone. That's kind of where I like to make the um, comparison there. Okay, so the next one is phthalates. This is a big one. So um, this is again, this is found in many plastics, which is another reason to avoid the plastics. Um, what it does is it makes plastic more flexible. So that's um, so more flexible plastic is the more phthalates it's actually going to have. So not only is it found in um, plastics, but it's a binder for scent. So it depends on the molecular weight of the phthalates that's being used. Cause this is a class of chemicals. It's not just one chemical, it's a class of them. So it's a matter of um, you know, the molecular weight. So when it's in the scented products, um, it's, it's because it binds scents. So for example, like those soaps that smell really good or cleaning supplies and detergent, dish detergents, things like that. Um, that are found within the kitchen, found within the home, um, if it has the word fragrance on the back of the label, 
that most likely means that it contains phthalates. And this is another wonderful loophole that a lot of companies can use because fragrance is actually an umbrella term that can house over 3,500 different chemicals, phthalates being one of them. So um, just opting for swapping out those products that might contain fragrance and cleaner, uh, cleaner items, um, which I do list in my book. I also have a ton of different link. Um, I have clickable links in there that you can use to just check out some of the products that I personally vetted and use myself. So again, phthalates, but they're commonly found in here. Um, I love this picture of the Mr. Clean and the Lysol and the Windex because those ones are notorious for having phthalates, right? They're in the very conventional cleaning items. Um, in your air fresheners, that's a big one too. So air fresheners and candles, those are going to be emitting phthalates as well. Anything scented really is going to have it. Um, unless it's going to say it has that organic essential oil blend or things like that, that do give it a nice little scent. Um, so, so those avoiding those conventional products is going to be really important. So again, avoiding ones that say fragrance on the back of the label. And we already talked about the plastic there. Um, and yeah, and then even scented garbage bags. That was another one that I wanted to mention, right? Because that's a, um, cause they'll provide a scent there to make your garbage smell better. But again, we don't want to be using those because that emits the chemicals into the air. And, oh, actually, let me go back real quick, just to talk a little bit more about um, emitting it into the air. So we um, we think we tend to think about, you know, chemicals as being bad when we're ingesting them, right? When we are drinking water or when we are eating foods that might be contaminated. But a big part too is what is being emitted into the air and off-gassing into the air that we're using that these candles, candles and air fresheners and um, cleaning supplies can be emitting. And the reason why it's important to think about that too is because when we are inhaling them or putting things on our skin, it's actually bypassing something called first pass metabolism. First pass metabolism is something where when we ingest food, it actually has the ability to go through our GI tract and then it goes to the liver to get broken down and the toxins can get um, binded onto and then excreted from the body. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So when we are inhaling these or um, toxins are getting onto our skin, right, it's bypassing that. So it goes directly into our systemic circulation, into the bloodstream, and then can get absorbed into the body and cause different health issues. So that's a, that's a reason why um, it's not just about what we are eating and drinking. It's about also what's in the air surrounding us. And I'll, I'll go into detail about that in a little bit. But continuing on about phthalates. So um, I just really like this picture here. This was taken from this really wonderful study by these two authors here, phthalates and their impacts on human health. Again, it's just showing, you know, personal care, daily use, toys, plastic toys, things like that, that will contain these phthalates. But here, how it leads to disrupting our hormones in adults, causing that overweight, um, obesity, allergic responses, and then how it can disrupt um, children as well, thyroid function, um, reproductive development, and things of that nature. So uh, pesticides, the other third one that I was going to talk about. So pesticides, um, there are hundreds of different kinds of pe pesticides that are used. They're sprayed on all our non-organic produce. Um, they bioaccumulate in animal tissue um, just because they're living longer. And then they also contaminate our water supply because they get into the, um, the runoff. And so it contaminates a lot of the water supply that we have. They, it gets on our lawns. Um, and again, yes, yeah, sprayed on our non-organic produce. So ways to reduce your exposure to pesticides are opting for organic when and where you can. Now, again, buying all organic can definitely be expensive. So a nice rule of thumb you can think about is if it has a thin skin, try opting for organic for those products because the pesticides um, are more absorbed right into the thinner skin produce. And then another thing you can do, whether it's organic or non-organic, um, you can soak after you buy your produce, soaking your um, produce in a baking soda or a vinegar solution after purchasing. This is something that I do. Um, it really just takes 10 minutes, just filling up the sink. I'll just, um, I use this ratio. It's two teaspoons of baking soda with four and a half cups of water. Um, just soaking it for 10 minutes or so, and then, um, letting it dry and then storing it in the fridge is a great way of helping to reduce the amount of pesticides that are on the produce. All right. So I know I talked a little bit earlier when it came to the phthalates and things that get absorbed into the air and then it's in the air that we are breathing in. So this was taken from the Environmental Protective Agency. So indoor air is two to five times more polluted than outdoor air. And it, this is taken directly from their site due to household cleaning products, air fresheners, et cetera. Even this little excerpt down here talking about how it is also being contributed from personal care products, pesticides, and household cleaners. So again, important to try to be avoiding 
these different chemicals that can be released into the air that can be inhaled and then caught go directly into our bloodstream into our systemic circulation so swapping out cleaning products even opening the windows right just for five to ten minutes a day um investing in an air fryer an air fryer those are great too air purifier um and then indoor plants so there was a nasa study that was done years ago that um, showed a few different types of plants that are really fantastic for purifying the air in the home. A couple of those are gonna be um, snake plants and then peace lilies. I have snake plants all over my house. I love them. They're relatively cheap to buy actually, and they look great and they're easy to take care of. So that's a win-win. Um, and then this was taken directly from the American Lung Association. They're stating that vo those volatile organ organic compounds, those ones that are emitted into the air and other chemicals that are released contribute to these different issues. Um, but they also recommend using only cleaning products that don't have those volatile organic compounds, fragrances, irritants, flammable ingredients, and that air fresheners should be avoided. And most cleaning products contain those. So again, when we talked earlier about, oh, you know, we think about going toxin free as being very expensive. And there are certain things that, yeah, it does have a bit of a price tag sometimes, but um, there are a lot of things that we can do that are free, right? So we can just throw out those candles. We can throw out those air fresheners, those scented products, right? Not buy those again. And then we can also open the windows in our home. We can leave our shoes at the door. So we're not tracking in pesticides, heavy metals, um, things like that mold that can come in from the outside as well. Those are all easy things we can do that can reduce our everyday toxic burden. And then finally, um, we talked all about how to avoid some of those different um, environmental toxins, but Ultimately, what's really important too is supporting your natural ability to detoxify, right? So we tend to forget sometimes that our bodies were made to, you know, eliminate these different toxins we come into contact with. So we have our lungs, we have our kidneys, our liver, our sweat, our GI system, our whole GI tract, and then our lymphatic system. So for example, supporting your kidneys, you know, staying hydrated, eating a plant-based diet, those things, eating blueberries and purple cabbage, the anthocyanins, and those are very protective for our kidneys against endotoxins, which are toxins created from bacterial issues that might be occurring within the body. All like all that is very helpful for our kidneys, for our liver, you know, supporting our liver with liver supporting foods like ginger and beets and turmeric and plant-based diet. Again, um, eating your Christopher's veggies upregulates a, upregulates a glutathione, which is our body's master antioxidant and necessary for liver phase one and two, um, detoxification, um, sweating, right. Um, sweating research has shown that sweat can, can, um, help excrete bisphenol BPA, heavy metals, pesticides, persistent organic pollutants. So it doesn't mean that you need to go do a hard cardio session, you know, every single day. I don't do that. Um, you can use a sauna. You can get into a hot bath, things that just help to promote sweating. Very, very important. Um, again, GI system, taking care of your um, health in that respect with, again, I'm always going to be talking about a plant-based diet, but, you know, eating a good plant-based diet with all the good fiber and the nutrients that come from that. And then finally, our lymphatic system, um, our lack, I like to think of our lymphatic system as our body's secondary garbage disposal system, right? And it helps to really eliminate and excrete toxins. Um, but the thing with the lymphatic system is that it doesn't have a pump mechanism like our heart does with our blood and like pushing um, blood through our veins and everything like that. It actually requires movement. So it's inter intimately intertwined with our muscles. So um, getting up and moving, just doing like a 30 minute walk a day or some sort of movement. Or if you, if you sit a lot for your job, you know, getting up every 30 minutes and just doing a couple squats or walking around the house for a quick second, right. Are going to really help to promote that lymphatic flow. And also staying hydrated is going to be very beneficial for your lymphatic system too. Um, and again, plant-based diet is very, very helpful in supporting all our different detoxification pathways because it's a concentrated source of those antioxidants. It helps to fight oxidative stress. The fiber helps to bind onto toxins, flush them out of the system. Um, and that's why I have here, it aids in detoxification. And then phytonutrients, phyto meaning plants and nutrients come from plants, right? This is very specific to a plant-based diet and containing those micronutrients that do support the liver, do support the kidneys, do support all these different um, important organs that help to eliminate toxins. So I always like to say, 
get a variety, get a variety of those plants throughout the week, right? Your cruciferous, we talked about how important those are. Leafy greens for your B vitamins and magnesium, colorful vegetables. Again, the different anthocyanins have amazing properties for all different areas of our body. Your alliums, your onions and garlic for antiviral properties, fruits, nuts, seeds, whole grains, B vitamins, and herbs and spices. Another easy way to get in some concentrated sources of nutrients are in those herbs and spices. So that's the presentation. Um, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Steph Peacock. Um, I started a YouTube channel about five months ago called Thrive Kitchen. And um, on my, this is my website, www.stephaniepeacock.com. Um, so I focus a lot on environmental toxins and gut health. So um, I focus specifically with irritable bowel syndrome and small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, but I also do virtual consults for detoxifying your home. So if you're interested, um, I, it's a three hour virtual consult where we go through room to room and I will give you, um, a great PDF in detailed PDF about how we can work on creating a healthier and happier home. And then also a 75 minute, um, virtual pantry cleanup. So just going through the kitchen and working on ways to incorporate a plant-based diet that works for you in your home and, um, how to eat healthier every day. So Thank you for having me. And then yeah, thank you. This was great. This was so much knowledge and they'll get even more if they get the bundle and I'll be post, I have been posting your link so they can get it from you right now. Cause we only have about, uh, let's see, oh. 24, 36 hours left, and then it is gone forever. So there's some questions in the chat. Perfect. Let me pull them up. Okay. And it, uh, guys, it really helps when you put four question marks first, like, uh, Mona did, would the plastic lids on glass containers present a problem? That's such a great question. I've been getting asked that question all week. So any sort of plastic will have some sort of something, bis bisphenol, right? That's going to get into the food. But what I always say is, again, we have to do what we can where we can. And I, all my all my glass containers are going to have that plastic lid. Now, those are a lot more durable. So they are going to have, they're not going to have those phthalates in there, which is a big, big plus. And also, you know, what I like to say is try to be mindful of not stuffing the container all the way to the top. So that way it's not touching the top of the container. But again, it's going back to reducing what you can, where you can, and not stressing over absolutely every little detail. But that's such a great question because I get asked that all the time. So yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks. Okay. And she also wants to know what water filter or water do you recommend? Yeah. So that's a great question. Now that really depends on the area that you live in, in the United States, because every, um, water supply is going to be different on what's contaminating the water supply. So for example, here in Southern California, I need to be using a reverse osmosis filter. And that's what I use. Um, within the book, I have a great link. And I think I gave it to you in the show notes too. There's a wonderful countertop reverse osmosis filter called AquaTrue. But again, that's, it, it depends on the area that you live in, in the United States, what kind of filter you might need. So wish I could be more helpful there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Jan wants to know what about the to-go soup containers that they use in most Chinese restaurants for soup? Is, are those like, those like really clear lids? Is that, I, I don't know. Cause you know, when I think of Chinese food, I think of more like, you know, that white box with the red white writing on it that has like the little. Oh, um, Okay. Those two, those, well, those definitely contain, um, BPA for sure. Um, because those are plastic containers, but, um, if it's the lids, I'm trying to, I, I'm not really sure what, um, if, if it's plastic and if it's durable, um, yes, it's going to, I'm sorry, durable, flexible. It will most likely contain both of those contaminants that I chatted about earlier. So I'm not sure. Great. Thank you. Uh, thoughts on microwaved items in plastic or the lids touching the food in the Pyrex while heating in the microwave? Oh, so that's a great question. So when it comes to, when it comes to the BPA and when it comes to the phthalates and the plastics, um, the chemicals get leached even at higher concentrations when you're heating. So again, that's something I also mentioned too, when it comes to like blenders and food processors, like I have those, those are plastic. Those are a harder plastic. Um, but what I try to be mindful of too, and always mention is that you don't want to be, you know, cooking a soup and then you immediately put it into the plastic where it's so heated and then it's going to leach those chemicals. You let things cool first before you place it into those containers. Same concept when it comes to microwaving in plastic, you, you definitely do not want to be microwaving in plastic containers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our Joyce wants to know, are plastic containers from Dr. Bronner's or Mrs. Myers or other more conscientious businesses safer in general? 
Yeah. So again, that's where it comes to down to we it's it's almost impossible to avoid all plastics. So um, I'm just going to have to leave it at that because yeah, major, a lot of companies that are wonderful, like Dr. Bronner's and other companies that are using plastics, um, you know, they're going to be using those and a lot, it's just so hard to avoid it. So, you know, if you're opt, if you're getting a wonderful fragrance free Dr. Bronner's soap or, and you're using it, you know, every day, but it's coming into a plastic container. I mean, that. It's just, we have to do what and where we can like, and the thing is too, when it comes to those plastics, right? A lot of it has been um, linked to um, really disrupting our gut, which will come into contact when we ingest it. Right. So I would say when avoiding the plastic, one of the best things to think about is try to avoid it in terms of what is like, what's, what are you holding your water in? Right. And drinking your fluids out of, but then also what are you eating your foods out of? So that's something I like to think about. Okay. Well, this is what I'm drinking my water out of. I hope it's okay. It looks good. I know I was, I was uh, looking, I was actually going to mention, I was like, it looks like Chef AJ has got a good one. <laughs> yeah. Cause Trinkle said no plastic. And then I have, this is my hot, this is my pot liquor. So hopefully these are safe. Those are perfect clean canteen. Yep. I love yep, that. And they're brand. purple. But yeah. yeah I have, I have, I have, everything has to be purple around here. I do. I know. So uh, Daria says, are the scents from essential oils also a problem? Because Mona's saying, now I have to look up my Yankee candle. Oh, Yankee. So um, Yankee candles are typically using some sort of fragrance. Um and I, I'm not sure about all of them, um, but candles are, yeah, that's a whole other, whole other thing. So that when it comes to candles too, it's about what the wick is made out of, right? A lot of those can be contaminated with lead. Um, but then again, too, when we're burning any sort of candles, we are releasing those, um, we're, um, releasing um, small amounts of chemicals into the air that that are at that microscopic pH 2 point, uh, not pH, sorry, PM 2.5, which we can inhale and then they can actually be um, disruptive to our lungs. And so usually I try to tell people, even when it comes to candles, like um, just be very conscientious of those. And I wish, you know, I wish that I actually, there's a couple of fantastic candle um, companies. One that comes to mind is called Meaningful Mantras. I will get mine from them. Everything in that company is absolutely fantastic. I have no affiliation with them. I just love to support that small business. They're great. Um, but yeah, when it, well, kind of answering the question before about the fragrance, um, so with essential oils, as long as it's an, or it says organic essential oils, um, that's usually fine. So when it comes in, when it's making the, essential. thank you. So, uh, let's see. Oh, Karen's saying she doesn't do essential oils because many are deadly to kitties. Yeah. We have pets to think about. I don't understand this obsession with smell, like people putting perfume and cologne on themselves. Uh, it's and and you know, like I'll go to a doctor's office, not here, but in LA and they would have the Glade plug in and I literally can't breathe. Like it activates my asthma. I go to yoga class and they'll burn incense. And it's oh. like, I can't like, what is this obsession with like covering up smells? And they're horrible smells. I, I completely agree with you. It, it, yeah, absolutely. And I like what she said too. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I, I rarely use essential oils because a lot are toxic to cats and dogs and things like that. So yeah. So I just say, you know what, just let's just smell the regular, normal outdoor smell. <laughs> the, yeah, you know, I, I don't get it. Okay. So let's see here. It, oh, I've got so many questions. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, yeah, this and, is great because they're saying you're an awesome wealth of knowledge. If she's a really a great guest, then buy the bundle from her. Use her link. Mm -hmm. And here's some questions. Um, oh, you're having trouble with PayPal. Um, well, it, if you need help, please contact uwlbundle at gmail.com. Okay. Is a countertop distiller for water good? Ask Susan. Um, okay. Countertop distiller. So like a distillation is what they're using to. So, so when it comes to distillation, um, what's happening is there. Okay. How do I explain? So distillation, unfortunately, isn't getting rid of a lot of chemicals. So especially pesticides, which we know are pretty much contaminate most of the water supply. So that to me, it, and again, it's always going to depend on where you live in the United States um, for this. But um, when it comes to distilling, it's still not getting rid of a lot of the um, chemicals that are in the water. Um, yeah, especially pesticides. That's a big one that they don't get rid of. So um, yeah, sorry to leave it at that. But <laughs> 
it does depend to like where you live on the United States. And that's something that I also go over. And um, if we're working on, you know, cleaning up the home and everything like that, I'll look into where it is that you live in the US and look at the um, water quality report. And that's, a, that's something you can actually do yourself. So you can, I meant, forgot to mention that I should have mentioned that in the PowerPoint. So you can actually just type in your city and just type in like water quality report and you can pull up, they're required to post it every year. So you can pull it up and you can actually see the contaminants that are tested for in the water supply. Uh, so that's actually something else you can do. That's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on different nonstick coatings on cookware? Yes. Yeah. So um, that was something I thought about putting in the presentation. I was, uh, but I was like, oh, I might, I might run out of time, but I'm glad this question is asked. So, yeah. So when um, there is nonstick uh, coating on cookware, that's containing those PFAS, which are the forever chemicals. That's between three to 4,000 different types of chemicals. Now it's termed forever chemical because it takes years. The half-life is many, many years. So it takes years to break down. So um, sadly, most of us have already been, you know, exposed to it and there's really nothing that we can do about it, but we can definitely change our exposure to that within the kitchen and in those nonstick cookware, that's a big, big one. And so opting for cookware that doesn't have that nonstick coating, like stain, and I give options in the book, but like stainless steel, cast iron, um, you can buy a relatively inexpensive cast iron skillet for like $40 on Amazon. Um, Lodge is a really fantastic uh, brand. I love their cast iron. But isn't iron a problem? I thought Dr. Barnard said it's a problem to use on iron, iron cookware. Oh, really? Oh, see, I haven't found there to be an issue with it. I mean, I could take a look again at the in power foods for the brain. I thought he said like it leached the I, I don't know. I, I It's been a while since I read the book. If anybody knows what I'm referring to from Dr. Barnard and why iron cast iron might not be the most favorable, because don't you have to use oil in a cast iron skillet? Okay. So that's a great question that you brought up with the oil. So yes. So you have to use oil to season the skillet. But what I always tell people is if you are using a cast iron skillet to reduce your exposure to the PFAS chemicals, then you use it a little, you just have to use a little bit to season it, but you can actually just wipe it right off before you actually cook with it. So that's something that I, that I'll say if people are, you know, obviously sticking to oil free and that's what I will do. Um, but, but that's interesting what you brought up with the cast iron skillet. So I'll, I'll definitely look into that for sure. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, it's actually very great to use those cast iron skillets, especially because, especially for women, because we know a lot of women are deficient in iron. So, um, at, so I'll leave it at, I'll leave it at that, but, um, cast iron is another great one. We talked about the, um, stainless steel, and then using like glass bakeware is another really great one. And then another really good one is actually 100% ceramic. So I will talk about that really quickly because this is something that I think there's a lot of misinformation surrounding that in the market. So you, when you're buying ceramic, you want to make sure that you're buying 100% ceramic. A really fantastic brand is called Xtrema. It's X, the letter X and then Trema. So Xtrema. Um, but there's going to be a lot of pans that will say they're either hundred um, percent ceramic or they're ceramic coated when it's ceramic coated, typically it's coated over an aluminum core. And when you're, you know, cooking at high temperatures with that aluminum, it's actually that aluminum will be leaching into the food. So that's why be very careful when you are purchasing any sort of ceramic items. Um, but in general, there's a couple of good um, companies out there. Extrema is the one that I personally vetted. They third-party test their pans to make sure there's no heavy metals also found in it. Um, and I think, um, I know you're having somebody on the show later, Stacey Heine. She has a discount code with them actually. So definitely check out her link at the Urban Pharmacy. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Here's a question from Kathy. Uh, where did it go? I, what about frozen rice that's microwaved in a plastic bag that like Trader Joe's has it, frozen microwavable rice is that type of plastic bag bad bad yeah unfortunately you know especially when you're you know if you're buying frozen foods and things like that but let me go ahead and tell you right now i buy frozen food i buy frozen veggies because that's just going to make my life easier sometimes on extremely busy, busy days when i'm working with patients and i don't have a lot of time to cook so and i don't do use them every single day but if you're you know if if it's going to help you to get in nutrients, that's okay. Let's say you're doing that. But what I would recommend is don't microwave it in the bag. I would just recommend taking the rice or taking the veggies out and then, you know, putting them into um, like a glass container to heat up. That would be my recommendation. Right. Cause they're asking if it's okay to, um, to, oh. to use frozen vegetables. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, 
Absolutely. You know, frozen, especially too, when it comes to frozen veggies and fruits, as you very well know, like a lot of times they're flash frozen and then they, they still contain like they're when they're by the, like right when they're picked. So then they actually contain a very high amount of nutrients too. So again, it's, it's reducing your exposure, like where and when you can, right. And if it's going to make your life easier to get in broccoli, that's frozen because you're very, very busy and that's your way of getting it in, then absolutely do that. I would just recommend, you know, if possible, maybe um, opting for the organic broccoli brand that will be at the store in the frozen aisle. Okay. Thanks. Lots of questions. Uh, so it, Darius says, is the plastic Vitamix container a problem when you're making soup in the Vitamix? Okay. So that's a great question. So um, again, it's when we're using plastics, you just want to make sure that you aren't putting any hot items into the container because hot is going to leach at um, a thousand times more than just putting anything at room temp or cold into the Vitamix or food processor or whatever it is that you're using. Now, again, we can't avoid all plastic. Plastics are in everything. And, but there's different grades of plastics. So again, when something's more flexible, it will have those phthalates, which are very endocrine disruptive and disruptive to our gut, as well as the BPA, of course. But um, we can't avoid all plastics. So I'm not going to tell you to avoid your Vitamix. I have a Vitamix. I have a food processor. I'm going to be using those for the short amount of time that I do use it. Right. So, um, don't worry about those. Those are completely fine. I would just stick with using well, those. Because, I mean, you know. when did it become so popular to start using plastic and did these companies know that it was going to be a problem? Yeah. So it became popular, um, right when they, this was back in, I believe, when was it probably like the eighties or seventies, but that's when they found, but so BPA was originally used as synthetic estrogen, but later found to be a little harder plastic. So that's when they started adding in BPA and bis all types of bisphenol into the plastics to be used. Um, and I, I, you know, I like to think that a lot of these companies didn't realize that they were going to be, you know, or the manufacturers that they were going to be very harmful to our health. But, you know, now that we're starting to see that they disrupt our hormones and disrupt different areas of our body. Absolutely. But a lot of times too, when it comes to just any of these chemicals, whether they're neurotoxic, carcinogenic, different things like that, that get used, um, into our everyday products they're a lot cheaper. They're a lot cheaper to use. So that's why, you know, there's different regulations within, within the United States versus in the United Kingdom, right? So a lot of the products that are very similar, like Johnson and Johnson, for example, it would, let's talk about their shampoo or something like that. Um, they, that same company will not use the, the same ingredients that we get in our products that are toxic to us, that they're also giving to the United Kingdom. Because in the United States, um, we have different policies and regulations that are in place and it's more of a innocent until proven guilty, um, in the United States versus, so a lot of things aren't getting tested prior to going onto the shelves versus in the United Kingdom and other areas of the world, sadly. So, so we have a, we have a ways to go in the United States with, when it comes to our products. Um, but I like to think that in the beginning, they didn't, you know, think it would be harmful to us, but it was just convenient and easy to use. And then we started realizing they weren't great, but you know, the regulations unfortunately aren't perfect here. So that's how we get exposed. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, does microwaving fresh or frozen organic vegetables destroy the nutrients? You know, I don't think so, but I, do, I you know, I, I don't actually know the answer to I think that. Dr. I, Berger has a video on that. So oh, I, okay. I can maybe try to find it, but I, I think he is okay with microwaving. Okay. I, yeah, I, I'll say I haven't looked into any other research or anything surrounding microwaves. I use a microwave. It's convenient. Um, and I, I didn't think that there was any issues with it. So that's good to know. He said that. <laughs> uh, Linda wants to know what about styrofoam and hot liquids in foods? Ooh, styrofoam. That's a big one. Yeah. Styrofoam contains very high amounts, actually more so than regular plastics of phthalates and of bisphenol. So, um, th that's a popular one. And that was what I, something I was originally thinking when someone else had asked about, um, from Chinese restaurants, I was thinking styrofoam was the first thing that popped into my head. So yeah, that's, that's a, a very big one to, um, try to avoid when possible. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. It's like, you can't do anything anymore. It's like <laughs> bring your own glass container. I know. I'm just got a water fast. Okay. All right. Yeah. So Dr. Goldhammer um, would approve of that yeah. one. <laughs> okay. So somebody, uh, thank you, Daria. She wrote Dr. Barnard said that using a copper or cast iron pan for cooking can lead to high levels of minerals in your brain. And when they reach toxic levels could 
even cause Alzheimer's. Cause I remember reading that book when it first came mm. out and, and I just remember like him saying, don't use those kind of, okay. kind of cookware. So, and anyway. so I wonder if maybe it's okay, you know, to use sparingly, just not be using all the time. Well, what about just using stainless steel? Exactly. I was just saying, if someone has a cast iron and that's just easier for them right now, maybe if they yeah. have it once in a while, but yeah, no, I agree with you. Stainless steel. Absolutely. And yeah. you don't have to buy them in sets too. You can buy them, you know, at just single items, you know, and this is me again saying, you know, I'm not trying to get you to go out and buy some expensive stainless steel set, just, uh, just reducing exposure to those nonstick pans for sure. So Darius you. says, what about the safety of the plastic lids on the clean canteen water bottles that touch our mouth? So, so usually a lot of them should be made with Sil like silicone and like kind of like a rubber. So is that a plastic that's on top on top of it that? It feels like it feels like rubber to me. I mean, I'm drinking from this. It, I mean, yeah. I so those it, are. It, this does feel like a rubber. That, yeah. I mean, yeah. So it those doesn't are, feel like plastic. It feels like rubber. Yeah, that's what they're using on those. They're not uh, using plastics. But if it does, if there is a company that is using plastic, but that you're drinking directly out of, but it's stainless steel, right? I would try to maybe switch the lid on that for sure. I but need a new one because look, I got it. I dropped it and it got all. You got to just oh. make sure though that the hot one you get is for hot because you will burn your hand if you put hot into one not meant for hot. Been there, done that. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, is Brita water filter or other pitcher style water filters containers effective and safe to use? Great question. So Brita is using a, I believe it's an activated charcoal filter. Really what that's getting rid of is primarily chlorine that is in the water. So yeah, it's going to be getting rid of some things and it gets rid of a couple other things too. I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, so it's going to be getting rid of something. So any filter is going to be better than no filter. Uh, but again, it really depends on where you live. So for example, for me, a Brita filter wouldn't work well for me because here in Southern California, so let me backtrack and a lot of, um, water facilities, they're using chlorine to disinfect the water. That's why it's in all water supplies. Right. Um, but in where I live, they're using chlorine plus ammonia, which is known as chloramines. Now a Brita filter, an activated charcoal filter is not going to be getting rid of chloramines, which is why I had to switch, make sure that I was using a reverse osmosis, which is going to help get rid of the chloramines that are found in my water supply. So again, it's going to just really depend on where you live in the United States. So for example, if you live somewhere that's not using chloramines and just chlorine, that's great. It's going to help to get rid of the chlorine that's in the water. Great. Thank you. Boy, lots of questions. This is a very important and interesting topic. Uh, where did it go? What is in the plastic container under your plant? The plastic container. Un Wait, what? I don't have a plant. So they're asking what's in the plastic container under your plant. Oh, my plant. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So this is a, um, so that's a ceramic pot. And then this is my um, fiddle leaf fig um, tree. It's, I actually bought it when I was working at True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California a few years ago. And it is so special. I love this plant. It's so beautiful. <laughs> and that's the plant you recommend for health reasons? No, no. Well, so, um, you know, all plants are going to help, but the, the ones that have shown to have the highest effect are going to be those snake plants and those peace lilies. Those are really fantastic. And I, I mean, I, oh, here I have one. Oh, wait, no, that's an aloe plant. Uh, can I, sh I'll show yeah, Please get it. But does it hurt the plant? If does, you, I mean, does it, does it harm the plant to have those to help us? Oh, does it harm? What harms the plant? Sorry, I'm well, not sure. Didn't you say those plants help us? Yes. So does it harm the plant to help? Oh, you mean because it's helping to detox there? Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Sorry. I didn't understand what you meant. Um, no, because I mean, there, the job of any plant really is to help just purify like the air. Right. And so they just do it at different concentrations. And so, no, it's not going to harm the plant and my plants are happy and healthy and they love me. <laughs> I give them lots of water and good stuff. So good sunlight. So yeah, this is a snake plant, by the way, this is super easy. And if you have a cat, fantastic for cats because cats will literally like to eat every leafy thing they can find. Right. And so these, they don't like these. I swear. I have a ton of these. They just like to rub their face on it. So perfect for it's cat proof. <laughs> Very cool. All yeah. right. Are Grove products. Okay. Asks Karen, not sure. Maybe that's a company. 
Oh, grow. I think I've heard of their stuff. Um, I, I think for one of my patients, I had looked into a deodorant from them and I didn't like the ingredients that were found in there. So, um, no, sadly, I, uh, I don't know about all their products. I don't, sorry. Okay. And what about silicone, like silicone bakeware, you know? Um, yeah, no, I, that's a great question. I, I've been getting that question a lot this week, actually. So, um, silicone is safe at, um, room temperature and at cold temperatures. So like those stasher bags, when you are using them for storing food, when you're using them, um, for, you know, just transporting around things like that, those are absolutely great. Some, um, the thing with silicone, I can't remember the exact degrees. I was just on someone's show talking about this, um, that when it's at a specific temperature, a very high temperature, it can actually start to leach that silicone into the food. So, or whatever you're cooking with. So, you know, what I usually recommend is you can use stainless steel, you can use glass cookware if you want to. Um, and then they, I can't remember the name of the brand. I have it in my kitchen, but it's just like these non-bleached parchment little cups that you can use to bake with too, um, that are really fantastic. So that way it provides that non-stick so you don't have to use oil. So, um, yeah, so those are all really great. And then it also in my website too, um, I believe I have kitchen items that I just uploaded on there, but I do have really great, um, options that you can use for cooking and, um, you know, cleaning and all that kind of stuff. So if you have any questions, you can always look over on my website too. Great. Thanks. And let's see, um, what cleaning products do you recommend? Asks Brenda. Oh, good question. So, um, my favorite is Branch Basics. That's what I use. Um, and what's really great is they have, it's a bottle that will come as a concentrate. And then they give you all these other bottles that will be for laundry. I don't use it for laundry. I use something else for laundry, but, um, but it's great for laundry, but you can use it for, it's for like your windows. It can be used for, you know, um, toilet cleaning. And then also just like everyday countertop cleaning. And you just put, you'll fill the container with a certain amount of water, and then you'll put a certain amount of that concentrate in it. And that's it. It's so easy. And all you have to do whenever you're rebuying is just whenever you run out of the concentrate, which by the way, will last you a very long time. You just order another bottle of that for like $50 and then you're good to go for a long time. So I use that. Um, and there's other really great ones that I also um, recommended in the book as well, but that's the one that I personally use. Nice. All right. Let's see. What about zero water containers? What, what, is, what is a zero water container? I don't know, Karen, what is a zero water container? Yeah. I didn't know. Oh boy. Uh, what about baking paper sheets used in dehydrating, baking, and air frying? Are they safe? Baking sheets. So um, like parchment paper, is that? What Maybe mean? that's what they mean by baking um, sheet. Be very okay, specific. Yeah. 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 Baking again, parchment paper is fine as long as it has, um, it has not been bleached. So those white parchment papers are not going to be good for you, but the, the brown ones, that's what I like to say. Get the brown ones. Your cat's so cute. He or she is grooming themselves. Oh, oh, my cat was at the, was over here. Yeah. Isn't that your, don't you oh, have right a cat? Here. Oh, I know. I was just looking right. Cause I have a cat right behind me too. I have two cats. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. There's a, that's a nutmeg. Yeah. She's Okay. <laughs> Cute. Uh, zero water is like Brita. Oh, okay. So then again, if it's, it depends, I, I don't know what type of filter, if it is using what the Brita filter is, which is that, um, carbon filter, the activated char charcoal filter, um, then, you know, it's again, going to just depend where, where you live. And I just want to make sure I say that, you know, any, any filter is going to be better than no filter. For sure. I, I actually just don't know what kind of filter they're um, or what mechanism they're using to extract chemicals because every filter will have something different. And people are, uh, Kimmy is asking, what do you think is seventh generation laundry detergent? And other people want to know what kind you use. Okay. So seventh generation. So if I was to give it a rating on a scale of A to F, I would give seventh generation a C plus. So there's still a few things that are in there that I personally don't approve of. Um, in terms of being, um, they don't, I believe they don't have phthalates, but they do have some other um, chemicals in there that I had looked at at one point that I didn't like. And so, um, my favorite laundry detergent is Molly's suds. They're great. I use theirs. And again, branch basics, um, has a good one. Um, bio clean, you can find that at a lot of stores. That's a good one. Um, and, uh, I, I know I gave a couple others in the 
book, but um, I don't know why I'm not already drawing blank right now on all the other ones, but I use Molly studs. <laughs> Some Alexandria is saying, is that seventh generation on the floor behind you? Over there, that's BioClean. <laughs> that's an oh. empty BioClean container, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, gosh, what I is, preach, I promise. I didn't know this is, I just realized I didn't have my light on the entire show. I just turned it on. Uh, Nurse Sandy says she uses vinegar for all her cleaning. That's fantastic. Thank you. I'm so glad someone brought that up because I don't know why I just drew a blank when, because uh, I have a whole great list that I give to my patients about like other ones I've vetted. That's fantastic. Yes. Use vinegar. Like I use that too when I clean and that's cheap. That's just so easy. You can buy a giant thing for like $3 and just right. that'll last you forever. It is so cheap. Uh, Karen is saying that zero water is a five-stage charcoal water filter. Oh, okay. Yeah. So again, I what I would do if I was uh, looking into that, because I've never actually looked at their testing. A lot of companies will test and show you when they filter the water through what was able to get filtered out. So that's something that I would look into to see what exactly like everything that they were filtering out. But that sounds really great. So if that is a five-stage um, water filter, that's going to be filtering out a lot of different contaminants. Absolutely. in the water supply. Now, again, it's just going to mat matter where you live. So what I would do, pull up that testing, see what their, what that filter is able to get rid of, and then pull up your water quality report and see what is found in the water supply that you have, and then compare it to. All right. I saw this comment from, I've got to find it from Susan, whose father worked for Gerber. And when they switched from rubber nippers to plastic, he, she, I guess they looked at the studies and then he wouldn't even let the family use plastic wrap. That's really interesting. It reminds me of those documentaries and movies you see where like the companies know, but they don't let you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And is it apple cider vinegar or white vinegar for cleaning? I would say just white vinegar, right? Yeah, white vinegar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what an interesting topic. I can't wait to read your book. And guys, if you want to read the whole book, please get the bundle, get it from Dr. Peacock. The link has been posted many times during the show in the chat, and it's also in the show notes. Is there anything you like about the bundle that you can't wait to dive into? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I know so many things. Like I it, honestly, the recipes are always what really gets me, but I love how there's just a variety of contributions to this bundle. Um, as there always is like last year, it's just like so many amazing contributions again, but um, it's the recipes. Like, I'm just so excited to dive into all the different recipes. I and know there's I over 2000 and uh, there's wonderful Japanese cookbook and just there's so much breadth and depth this time. Uh, last question. Lavanda says, do you like the Berkey water filter? Yes. So the Ber actually the Berkey water filter is a fantastic one. I actually will use that for when I travel. Now for where I live again, it's not going to get rid of everything. It gets rid of a lot. So it, it is a great filter actually. Yeah. They're fantastic. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's great catching up with you, Dr. Peacock. Thank you so much for having me on again, Chef AJ. And again, um, I know I have the, you know, I know it'll be in the show notes, but people can find me on Instagram and all that stuff. And you can just message me on there too. If you have any questions, I'm always happy to help because um, it's important. So yeah. Um, thank you. And your cat just like has been grooming the whole show. Like, you know, it's hilarious. I've been watching that. It's adorable. And thanks to all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in 15 minutes for the arthritis recovery hour with Clint Pattison. And he'll be talking about how medication 